All right, let's get a view from the Hill on this issue and the others rumbling around Parliament today. They're all Ontario and all rookies. Liberal MP Karina Gould, Conservative MP Karen Vecchio, and NDP MP Tracy Ramsey. Welcome to you all. Uh, this Gomeshi thing, I know you don't want to get into the exact deal with the trial because it, it, it might be appealed, but, it, but in your view, I'm wondering, uh, do we need changes in the criminal code to at least raise the comfort level of victims of sexual assault that uh, might be hesitant to come forward, particularly after seeing the goings on in this trial. Karina? Well, thank you, John, for that question. And as you know, all Canadians can see in the mandate letter of the Minister of Justice, I mean, there is a commitment to improve the criminal justice system, particularly for victims of domestic violence. So uh, I think in a general sense, there, there is a, an objective and a desire to make sure that victims who do come forward um, are commended for that and are also able to present in a way that uh, we'll, we'll see outcomes that are, are related to justice. And how do you legislate that because you know there has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt unless you change that litmus test it doesn't seem to make much difference will it? Uh, you know, I think the important thing for our government is that we believe that all Canadians have a right to a life free of violence. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we're going to be working on over the coming years, over our mandate. Uh, and, you know, the Minister of Justice is going to be working extraordinarily hard with the Minister of the Status of Women so that we can bring forward legislation that pr protects survivors of violence and children and ensures dignity and respect. All right, Karen, what's your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, sitting on the Status of Women Committee, this is something that we're currently studying. and unfortunately Unfortunately, with what we saw today, it does really concern me because our victims going to come forward. And you know, we have the victim bills of rights, but we are protecting in this situation, or maybe maybe other situations, um, where the offender has done something. And are the victims going to come forward? And those are the things that, because of outcomes like today, are going to once again frighten victims away from coming forward. So those are the things that I'm very concerned of, whether it's domestic abuse or uh, abuse that's helping. Uh, existing on campuses. We have to be very aware of this and uh, although it's a very sensitive issue, right. we have to make sure that uh, women and men can step forward in a sexual violence right. situation. And the question of course is, I mean, you've got to, I thought the judge made a very odd comment when he mm. said basically we don't want to reinforce the stereotype uh, of women that saying they, they're automatically deemed to be truthful. I thought that was pretty <laughs> odd, but I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, Tracy. I mean, how do you balance the rights of a victim to come forward and make the complaint mm -hmm versus the guy who may be wrongly accused, you can't uh, rule that out. I think it's no mistake that we have a current, uh, you know, system where and, and an outcry right now in the public and social media with the hashtag "We Believe Survivors." You know, this is a public outcry saying that our system is broken. The justice system does not stand up for uh, survivors of sexual assault, and the system needs to be overhauled. We need to have a system where they're heard and they aren't judged on the way that they uh, responded to their particular assault. There is no normal response to being sexually assaulted. Each person person has their own uh, path that they find to survival and so we need to recognize that and not judge them on uh, how they arrived at that point. Um, the system itself is extremely broken. I'm just trying to figure out how you do this. Like how, how do you make the system so that women feel comfort comfortable coming forward after the, probably the most traumatic experience of their life mm -hmm. and say I don't want to go on trial. Yeah. This guy's got to go on yeah. trial. But I'm scared to come forward because I've just seen what happened in the Gomeshi case. Karina? Well, not commenting on this case in particular, but one of the, the things that um, you know, the, the Ministry of Justice is looking, or the Department of Justice is looking at, is um, the reverse on the onus of bail in repeat domestic violence instances, yeah. right? And that's, you know, it, it's not a perfect solution, but it is, it is an important step that puts the onus on the individual to claim that they deserve bail and mm -hmm. I, so I think there are definitely mechanisms that we can that we can put forward I think there are creative solutions that we can that we can work on and, and I think you know our government is looking to the committee on the status of women and looking to the committee on on justice and to work together to find these solutions so that as I said you know that Canadians all Canadians men women children uh, can feel and have really the right to a violence-free life hmm. anything you want to add to that at all Karen you know I do appreciate exactly 
exactly what Tammy's saying. Where mm -hmm. coming forward is going to become more of an issue each and every day. And you know, um, I think what we've done in many cases that the victim is the one put on trial. And we saw this in so many of the cases in, in pre historically and, and in once again today. And we've got to be very cautious of what we're doing to our victims because we're re-victimizing each and every time mm -hmm. they're on the stand or trying to tell their story. And that's not fair to them as well. Last word to you. It's the system. You know, it really is. Do we need a new system? Do we need a special court for these cases? Um, you know, we look at this particular case and we see uh, the victims coming forward telling their story, but we see the accused not speaking. And so really we aren't seeing the full picture and what happened in these scenarios. And for those who have gone through this experience now, you know, it's heartbreaking to think that they've put themselves out there, they've shared this story, uh, hoping that they will have justice and they've not received that. Put their memories on trials, basically what we do. All right. Moving on to the messy business of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, the Bank of Montreal put out their analysis of the budget today and they gave an interesting comment. They basically said that Canada is no longer special, neither within the G7 nor across the broader OECD. While a short-term deficit is entirely appropriate given a rising unemployment rate, our quarrels with the total lack of a longer-term plan to reverse course, they may regret that. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. I guess that's magic to your ears, Karen. <laughs> well, you know, even the title that they used is red is the new black. You look at that and that's exactly what we saw. On, on Tuesday morning I was dri driving in a cab after a University of Ottawa interview and uh, the cab driver asked me, oh today's budget day, what do you think? And I, and I started laughing. I said, well, you know, what are your thoughts? He said, well, red's a little, a little red's okay. He said, but this one, this is deep, deep red. And those are concerns of many Canadians and that's what I see. You know, small deficits are necessary once in a while, especially if we're going through a crisis situation or anything like that. But we see a debt and a deficit here that is looking at $30 billion and over the next five years, $113 billion. At the end of the time and at the end of this mandate, it all falls on taxpayers and all of our Canadian families. And yes, they talk about the middle class, but it's going to be once again the middle class that's also paying back this debt. And that's what makes me extremely concerned. Okay, Tracy, uh, you guys started off saying deficit's bad. Uh, how do you deal with this one? Well, listen, clearly the situation is not what we thought it was or the Liberals thought it was. So now we are facing this deficit. And as Karen's saying, you know, we have to be cautious about the deficit that we're incurring. So this was meant to be this uh, huge infrastructure budget. The infrastructure funds are not there uh, in the way that was committed. There's no plan involved. Um, it doesn't address other sectors. You know, there's nothing there for auto. There's nothing for manufacturing. There's nothing for agriculture. There's nothing for many sectors that would have improved the economy and uh, essentially put jobs and uh, you know people back to work which turns the economy so we see some glaring uh, missed opportunities here and uh, we believe that uh, the budget if we're going to into, go enter into this large deficit we have to justify that but the question here Karina is I know you I know you're gonna take exception to some of the comments there I'll let you get to that but first quickly say I don't understand I think the bank makes an interesting point you got you can go in we understand that you went into deficit mm -hmm. and we're not they're not raising too many red flags at that, but they're saying no roadmap, roadmap That's back right. to black. Mm -hmm. That's right. Why not? At least give us a. I mean, I, Justin Trudeau I mean, says I, maybe on the fifth year. I don't know what that means. He's got well, no. But I, th I think uh, you know, I think we have a really good news story here. I mean, I think I'm that, sure you do. that no, <laughs> we, we do. The the budget has been very well received. I mean, the comments that we've received across the board have been overwhelmingly positive. Um, it, I, I find it a little rich from the Conservatives and the NDP, but you know, the Conservatives put us into this situation. I mean, they left close to $10 billion unspent of earmarked funding last year. And so I think on March 31st, we're going to be seeing a very different picture of the fiscal year, the previous fiscal year. Uh, when it comes to the NDP, sometimes I'm sitting there and thinking they, they haven't read the budget yet because, you know, there, there, is, there is commitments in there for manufacturing. I mean, there's a huge innovation fund. When we're talking about infrastructure, that's it's, it's, fund. That's it's money about that was left $12 there from billion. The conservatives that it's was about, not spent I think a broken we program. Have a, I think we that's have a broken a, program. If you ask you anyone in manufacturing, I think that that's I a broken think it's piece. Respectful okay. thing if we yeah, let yeah, each other speak, okay. right? <laughs> uh, it's a decorum that we're trying to encourage in the House, so I hope we would do the same on this panel. Well, well, not tough always. Question. We tough 
tried. questions need to be <laughs> answered too. 12, 12 billion dollars on infrastructure spending. I mean, when it comes to agriculture, there's commitments for research and innovation. There's commitments for the CFIA, uh, the Canada Food Inspection and nowhere Agency. Back to black. Yeah. And nowhere back but to black. But it's also no. about understanding that we want to grow this economy, right? We need to invest. I mean, it's if you don't invest, you're not going to grow. You're not going to make strides. And we have a lot of really positive steps that we're taking forward, and we're hoping that this is something that by investing in Canadians, investing in the economy, that we are going to help move this country forward and have a legacy that we're going to leave for our children and grandchildren that is extraordinarily okay. positive. Let's move on. The final topic, Bombardier. Mm -hmm. uh, the Prime Minister wanted to have talk about child benefits. Instead, he got a lot of <laughs> questions on Bombardier. Uh, uh, whether this be a bailout or not, here's what he had to say earlier today. We're looking very carefully at Bombardier's situation to look at how uh, we can support uh, the aerospace industry in Canada, the jobs that come with it, but not just uh, in the short term, but for the medium term and indeed uh, the long term as well. Okay. Uh, the Prime Minister says maybe a bailout, maybe not. Probably a bailout seems to be in the offing. Jobs are still being sent to Mexico and China. One of the executives came out yesterday and said, meh, we don't really need the bailout. What do you say? What's the conservative response you know, to this? Do you let them hang out there without their money or do you give them the cash? Well, first of all, I don't think uh, necessarily a bailout is the right thing to do. I think that we see an economic plan that had an opportunity for the Billy Bishop Airport in Toronto. Our Conservative Party has continued to say that. Uh, we saw that it was chosen by the Transport Minister after a lot of political interference that that was chosen not to expand that airstrip. Uh, I have friends who live downtown Toronto who said to me, we don't hear what's going on there. That is not, a, that's not a situation. It seems that there's been a lot of interference on this. Uh, Bombardier had another opportunity to sell their jets. Ne I don't think it's necessarily up to the government to create jobs, and we saw this when we talk about the budget. We talk about job creation. We need private sector job creation, not bureaucratic job creation that we've seen, which was just budgeted on, on tables on Tuesday. And so those are concerns. We need business investment. Now, is Bombardier the right way to invest? Not necessarily the case because we have seen a number of uh, projects and a number of bailouts to them in the previous years, but we already have something on the table and that's called the Billy Bishop Airport. Well, that's only a small part of the business it's, it's plan. It's part, though. but, uh, and you know, some, if that's one, right. but I got to move along. Quick thought from you on this one, Karina. Uh, well, th I, I agree with you. This, that's a very small part of it, uh, although the Conservatives like to hammer on that. But I think what's important about the Bombardier case is that as a government, we recognize that, you know, they are key contributors to the economy and that this is a very important decision that has to be weighed carefully. Canadians expect that, the, that Minister Baines will do his due diligence on this, that he will engage as deeply as possible to make sure that you know we're, we're getting the solution that's best for Canadians and mm -hmm. for the economy. Quick last word to you, Tracy. I think it's lovely rhetoric, but these are people, these are jobs, they're important mm -hmm. to the communities, they're important to Quebec. They actually have spin-off effects in these communities that are tremendous. We've done this before uh, as a government, and it's the right thing to do in our current economy. Okay, thank you all. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you, you in a few weeks. Thank, thank you. you very much.